All right, we're gonna uh, we'll get started. Though I'll come over here. Um, obviously, I'm very excited about doing this. Uh, before we get started, um, I don't know where Constantine is from Reed Smith. Uh, Reed Smith is uh, sponsoring this. They're amazing. Keith and I don't know really where we are in the store, uh, but we're here. This is a cool place. And uh, Reed Smith's like an 1,800-person law firm. They do everything from tech. They've got a huge crypto practice, et cetera. Uh, I use them for a bunch of stuff. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. Either I'm an idiot or they're good. Um, but uh, if you are looking for any legal services, uh, talk to Constantine. He's the, there he is right there. I, I was going to say the good looking guy. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but go check them out. So thank you guys so much for, uh, for sponsoring this. All right. Are you ready, Keith? You got to turn it on, I think. Now I'm ready. Yeah, see? There we go. Wind me up. That, I'm that's ready the to only go. time tonight that I will look better than Keith. All right. Uh, <laughs> what is your resting heart rate? Uh, it's 46 today, which is lame. Why? It should be 44. <laughs> that's a great place to understand Keith Ramoy. Um, why is health, diet, berries, all this, like, like, why do you spend so much time on it? And what has changed over the years around your health or diet uh, in, in your life? So it's a function, I mean, truthfully, it's a function of vanity, life extension, and performance, and they're all related. Like, you can't disambiguate these. Some things are really around, like, how do you live longer, like, have more lifespan, so to speak, when you can be active. The disadvantage of getting old is you start thinking that way. Uh, second thing is definitely aesthetics, like vanity, like anybody else, I just, like, I'm conscious about it. And the third is pure athletic, athletic performance and competing with people and competing for various things. So, for example, resting heart rate, mostly around life extension. Uh, Two-minute recovery is definitely around life extension. Um, you know, other things are designed for other purposes. Uh, berries just happens to be the most efficient way to do it. Like, so okay. I'm generally pretty busy. In one hour, I can do everything I need for all three goals. And it's the only time probably during the day that I put my phone away, which is a pretty big accomplishment. Maybe date night. I'm usually pretty good at putting, uh, we do two day nights a week, I'm usually pretty good at putting my phone away. So are you optimizing for longevity or you're optimizing for all three of them? Pretty much all three. Like for example, if you were optimizing only for lifespan, you'd probably never drink alcohol. You can debate this whether you should have like a glass of red wine once in a while. But like I actually do drink alcohol, so obviously I'm not totally optimizing that way. Um, but like generally speaking, optimizing for the middle of how do I live longest, be as high performance as possible, like mentally. So I optimize my sleep. We were talking about Mateo just briefly, but like I've been optimizing my sleep for like 30 years, like literally eight hours sleep basically every day, um, and then reverse engineer everything around that. So it's a combination. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of topics that uh, some of them are very down the fairway. Some of them will people will leave scratching their heads, being like, what are these guys talking about? Um, but Part of why I want to start off talking about fitness is there's a mental clarity that comes with being fit, with eating healthy, et cetera. Is there anything that you do specifically for the mental clarity or the ability to think better, make better decisions? Well, sleep is definitely the number one variable. If you're going to change anything in your life, if you change your sleep, you're both going to live longer most likely, but you will definitely think smarter, act smarter, have a better personality. I used to remember when I was um, an executive at Square, I'd present, you know, I'd, I'd actually run the board meetings at Square. and. Um, I had this board member, some of you will know, Mary Meeker was on my board, and she would observe after a couple of years that she could tell how much sleep I had the night before a board meeting uh, because my vocabulary would suddenly shift and I would use like less elegant words. And usually, my, uh, usually before a board meeting, my adrenaline would be running, so my sleep was mediocre. But the, the fact that she could notice this, and I actually knew the sleep differences and she was picking up on it, it was just evidence of how you act differently when you haven't had you know, a perfect night's sleep. Obviously, there's great studies done by the Stanford basketball team about free throw shooting and three-point shooting um, that really make it clear that elite trained athletes, the Stanford basketball team historically has been pretty good. So if you can add 10 percentage points to free throw percentage by sleeping an extra hour, that's like amazing. You could train for the rest of your life and not add 10 percentage points to your free throw percentage or like similar comparable percentages to threes. So that, that was very eye-opening, but I was already pretty dedicated to sleep. So when we think about how to think, before we actually talk about specific topics, uh, you're trained as a lawyer. I think you practiced for like maybe three days. No, I was dumb enough to practice for three and a half years. Okay. My friend Peter Thiel for, uh, practiced for three months and four days, and he still introduces the, me as this is my greatest character flaw. He like literally, he'll be like, oh, Keith's obviously incompetent because it took him three years to figure out what I figured out in three months. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> true story. Actually, he's I, done this several times. I in have public. no doubt that's a true story. Uh, w- what did the legal training, though, uh, from a how to think standpoint, like, what do you attribute that you took away from it? Well, there's a way of thinking that you learned as a lawyer, and some of it's very valuable across all disciplines. Some of it's very narrow. The the part that you, you do develop a hierarchy of thoughts and an organized mind. One of the ways you can tell is if you ever date somebody who goes to law school, you will see his or her mind change before you. Everybody who has who dates somebody through law school notices the change in like how their significant other starts to think. So that that's really useful. You do learn a little bit too much of what they call issue spotting. So when you get graded in law school, the the primary driver of your law school exam grade is how many of the potential issues can you identify, things that could go wrong, and then can you resolve them, meaning discuss how they would most likely be resolved by a court of law. Uh, the problem with this, so it's a very good uh, general exercise like of avoiding risks in life, but it leads to a little bit of overthinking because every, everywhere you go, everything you see, all you do is see problems. It's like problems to the left, problems to the right. It's like that song, Joker's to the left, you know. Uh, so you start thinking like everything that can go wrong, which really doesn't help you, certainly not as an entrepreneur or investor. Like when people pitch me with an, uh, a new investment idea, it's obvious what can go wrong. <laughs> the, hard, the hard part is what can go right. Um, but so that part doesn't translate as well. And then the part that also translates relatively well is, you know, I've been involved in a lot of financial services heavily regulated areas with IP issues or like healthcare with with lots of legal issues. And being trained as a lawyer allows you to navigate stuff for yourself as rather than outsourcing it to some black box. And so I like things that have le- perceived legal and regulatory risk because I don't outsource the diligence to other people. So when you think about that pathway to becoming an investor or an entrepreneur, are there certain operational roles or certain investment styles that lend itself? If, if you have been trained as a lawyer, you're more likely to be better at operations or marketing or uh, a venture investor or a hedge fund investor. Like, How do you think about the overlap uh, coming into investing in business? A global statement is I always believe that you should invest in things that you have an asymmetric advantage in. So the earlier in your life you figure out what your asymmetry is, the easier it is to you know sort of magnify that, amplify, double down on it. So if you're a lawyer, per my point, I love things with legal risk. Like the, maybe the most obvious example of this is when YouTube first uh, was started. Uh, yeah, I knew the founders from PayPal. We'd worked together at PayPal, and I met them at a barbecue, or I met one of the three, ran into one of the three at a barbecue, and I asked them just casually, like, "Hey, what are you up to?" Just like you would you know, do, like, sort of introduce yourself to any friend at a barbecue, and he said, "Oh, I just launched this new company." And it's like, well, what's it called? And it's, it's called YouTube.com. And I said, okay, what does it do? And he, he basically is like sharing videos, blah, blah, blah. I asked him three questions, um, literally as we're in line to get a drink, like literally like in line to get a drink at my friend's place. And at the end of those three questions, I was like, I need to invest. Can I invest? And he's like, don't you want to see the website? And at the time, this is like 2005 or six or something, we didn't have like, you know, basically computers in our pockets. And so he goes to the host, this guy named Mike, and says, hey, can we borrow your computer? And so we go off into Mike's bedroom, and for the next hour, he shows me every single video on YouTube, which was very painful, but it, he did allow me to invest. Now, the point of the story, though, is when people, when I started telling other people about the potential opportunity to invest with me, because back then I couldn't write a big enough check myself, so I needed other people, every single person talked to their lawyer friends. And every single fund was like terrified of the legal risk. And so I just walked through my favorite funds at the time, the legal diligence myself. I just said, here's what people are going to tell you, and here's the right answer, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, not surprisingly, we were able to convince a very good fund to go invest. Uh, but, like, if I didn't understand IP law, so I happened to have been partially an IP litigator, there's no way that I would have been able to do that, A, with confidence, and you. You know, enough credibility to convince a very large VC fund, but B, would I have known the right answer myself? Almost surely not. Kind of funny anecdote to this is there was one part of the law that I forgot. So, um, you know, I graduated law school a long, long time ago and had quit a few years before this. There's a slight part of law around music licensing that's, uh, that works very differently than standard law and certainly IP law because Congress passed a statute in like 1914 or 1910 or something where every time music plays in the background, there's a statutory fee. So it's one of the few things that doesn't, doesn't have a market price. And I sort of forgot this part because it doesn't generally conform to normal principles of law. So when YouTube did eventually have some legal risk, it was only because of the background in music being played in the background of the videos that caused a problem. They never had IP risk around the actual videos, which is what everybody was paying attention to, but I sort of forgot that. Now we passed the statute of limitations, so I can tell the story. What were the three questions that you asked? 
is it coded in Flash, was the number one one. Um, it, there's a reason for that. I'd been waiting for three years to find a company uh, founded on Flash. So my friend Max left. Why? Well, so <laughs> after we left PayPal, um, I went to work sort of uh, part-time with my friend Peter Thiel. And Peter said, go down to Mountain View and figure out the future. And what he meant is go talk to Max, Max Levchin. And so I was like, okay. So I, I called Max. I'm like, Peter's dispatched me down to Mountain View to meet with you to figure out the future of technology. <laughs> Max is like, okay, whatever. So we sit down and he starts, you know, he's like, I can't really predict the future, but blah, blah, blah. He's like, one thing that is kind of cool is this thing called Flash. And I had no idea. I'd heard of it, but no idea why. So he explained to me all the magical properties in 2003 that Flash had and that someone would take advantage of it, particularly around commerce, but like, here's what it could do that other people weren't realizing. So I'd been looking around, scouring the universe to find some way to invest in Flash. And then I realized as he's talking about videos that Flash was actually a pretty good application for that. Second um, question was around whether it was long tail videos or he was targeting like professional videos. And he said long tail videos, which led to some of the legal analysis, but made me more interested. I always am interested in long tail stuff. Still am interested in long tail stuff as the guys from Open Store here know. And then third, the question was, uh, we had a, well, we had a PayPal product that internally we called X, X click for the web. What that really was, was an HTML button you can embed in your eBay listing. And that's what led to the viral adoption of uh, PayPal back in the day. And so I said, are you gonna be able to do something like X click for the web? And he's like, yeah, that's the whole plan. So fully embedded flash video that could be embedded anywhere and it would lead to ideally the same adoption as PayPal, and it actually turned out to be the case. Pull it back to the website. Uh, you mentioned PayPal. How much of it is like nurture versus nature? You got the right people into that business versus you guys had some magic potion and got everyone to be really smart and go on to be super successful afterwards? I think it was mostly that Peter and Max deserve a lot of credit for hiring people. So Peter hired most of the non-technical people. Max basically hired all the technical people. And they assembled a critical density of talent, and then that became self-fulfilling, meaning the derivative people that were hired were probably comparable. And you know, you get a critical density of talent, all of a sudden things that are unsolvable become solvable. I don't think, it, I mean, there was definitely lessons I learned that I specifically abstracted from those days and those people, but fundamentally it came down to their hiring skills. Last question I have about uh, kind of history. PayPal obviously is uh, now not only uh, very well known that story, uh, but everyone went on to do such great things that I think a lot well, of- Well, not everyone. There's, <laughs> there's 254 people there. You know probably about 20 names. <laughs> 20 people went on to do great things. Uh, but I think a lot of young founders look at that and they're like, wow, that was just like amazing business. Um, on a scale of like, you guys had your shit together to it was a complete shit show internally. Where were you on that scale? It was a complete shit show internally. <laughs> um, like, well, one easy example of that is we had three CEOs in four months. So usually you don't have three CEOs in four months unless things are going pretty catastrophically wrong. Uh, the, you know, the other empirical data point is in August 2000, uh, we had a burn rate of $10 million a month and $30 million in the bank in the, co in the middle of the complete internet bubble collapse. That's a real problem. Um, but it was always kind of a mess. It was a kind of a fun, chaotic mess. It was intentionally chaotic, though. Once things started working, uh, Peter came back as interim CEO after we fired Elon Musk, September 25th, 2000. And within a couple months, it was clear that the you know, first derivative and second derivative were good or better. And then you know, things did work, but it was always, always a mess. There'd be like all these random things that you thought everything was okay, and then boom, you know, get slapped in the face with some very pleasant surprise. So in November, uh, I was mindlessly scrolling on Twitter and I saw somebody uh, chirp at you and say, are you calling the top? And you responded- It was October 18th, by the way. And, and you said yes, and I said to myself, they better hope to God he's wrong because he'll never <laughs> let them forget. <laughs> so by the way, it wasn't a random person. This is, uh, it was Ari Levy of CNBC. Yes. So he's a pretty well-known journalist. And I think it was the day of the top? It was exactly the day. <laughs> It was off by a couple hours. <laughs> so uh, they have not forgotten because they keep bringing it up. Um, describe why you thought it was that. And a lot of it, I think, came from the 2000 uh, kind of bubble bursting and, and kind of what the historical uh, overlay was. So, yeah, I mean, in 2000, a lot of people had this view, including a lot of my colleagues at Founders Fund that I've been, um, uh, let's say, cracking a whip on recently, um, that things just go up and to the right. And, and then 
it's only a question of time. Like every company will be worth more money or more value over time, whether it takes one year, two years, three years, or five years, so that you could pay any price for an investment, let's say, because eventually you'll grow into that. And that's logic. Over the last 18 months, Peter and I particularly internally were like, this market is going to collapse. Here's why, blah, blah, blah. So internally, we've been debating this uh, pretty consistently uh, with, with incredible clarity. Both Peter and I argued this at an offsite last summer and then strongly argued it like about a week before. So one of the reasons why when I already asked, we had, done, we had conducted an offsite in San Francisco about a week or two before. And I'd made strong case internally that we should stop investing, period. Like there is nothing that's priced appropriately. So my brain had been chewing on this. It wasn't kind of a random response. Um, that said, the lesson of 2000 was, you know, things that go this way also go this way. And the sp specific reason things collapsed in 2000 was the Federal Reserve raised interest rates six times from mid-1999 to early 2000. And what that did was it caused technology stocks to collapse collapsed by 90%. So it's like, well, guess what? If the Fed raises interest rates six times, technology stocks are gonna collapse by 90%. This is like a law of physics. We had actually used this um, slide, a version of this slide, which I've actually tweeted recently, in our LP presentation at Founders Fund the last two years. So we'd, we'd been internally talking to our LPs saying, eventually interest rates have to go up. When interest rates go up, technology stocks will go down. Yeah, we can talk about why that is, but it, it is actually inevitable. And so when the, the reason why that specific timing came to be is for a long time, many people, myself included, have been talking about publicly, Jack Dorsey, et cetera, that we've been going through inflation in the United States. Um, I started tweeting about inflation in January 2022. And, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, the, maybe actually 21. But yeah, 21, sorry, getting the years confused. And, but everybody was, uh, the government, the, the current administration and their you know, sort of supporters, we're in denial about that we're inflation and that we're suffering inflation and there's all these excuses. It's like transitory, blah, blah, blah. You should see the reaction to my tweet about we're in real inflation and everybody's like, it's transitory. I'm like, no, it's not transitory. That's the stupidest thing ever. Um, but basically all the excuses were starting to decay over the last year. And by October, even the transitory people like ran out of logic to argue that it was transitory. So I was like, basically what's gonna happen is eventually when the excuses go away, the Fed and everybody else is going to realize we have actual inflation. When they have actual inflation, the technology stocks will start going down. And so that's basically what happened. So when, when there was one press conference, I think the White House press secretary basically gave up on the transitory line. I was like, okay, all hell's going to break loose. And that was right around then. And that's why I was like, okay, well, you don't have to discount the probability that people figure this out anymore. So I don't want to spend too much time on macro, but uh, they say inflation is 8.6% now. The Fed, when it was 7% back in December, was still uh, conducting quantitative easing. They hadn't raised interest rates. Just what's your general take in terms of uh, maybe incompetence, ignorance? How do we get here? And then how much confidence do you put in their ability to uh, navigate a, I think they call it a soft landing now? Um, <laughs> what, so, what do you soft think landing, kind of euphemistic for? for recession, or like a moderate recession, um, moderate unemployment, moderate recession. Um, no, there's an old paper from Milton Freeman in 1972 that you all should read. Basically, Milton Freeman argued among many things, but th this probably is number one Nobel Prize winning contribution, is that a federal central decision maker, whether the Federal Reserve or some other institution, will always get this wrong. They will always <laughs> raise rates when they should be lowering them and lower rates when they should be raising them. Basically, the lag is too great, so that leads to co consistent oversteering because you're basically amplifying the problem by the time you act, but then it makes the problem worse. So the best thing to do is to do nothing in his view, and it's a very well-argued paper. So this is a classic illustration of that. Uh, but um, right now, I don't know, all I can do is go shopping. So this is what I've told several, several people here before. Just go to the grocery store, and if the price of your groceries is going up every week, we have inflation. If they start settling and being stable, then you know we're fine, and then when they start going down again, we'll have deflation, which is not necessarily a good thing. But in any event, groceries are still going up as far as I can tell. The craziest thing to me is, uh I don't know why I did this, but one day I went deep down the rabbit hole of how they calculate inflation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's There's absurd. <laughs> 466 people who are employed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they go into the grocery store, and they're giving a printout, and they make sure they find the exact Campbell soup tomato with no salt. And it's like an 11-page document to make sure they have the right one, and then they punch it into a, uh, a device. So, yeah, so when we, when we were starting Square before we launched, we wanted to build a true inflation tracker. 
So because we had all these goods and services, obviously you know, sales in real time, price adjustments basically in real time. And so when Jack started tweeting about inflation and hyperinflation, I was like, he's looking at real data. He's not making this stuff up. He's not a macro, he's not being a macro thinker. He's actually seeing the data. And so it was so obvious from the square data that we had real inflation in early 2021. Well, it's not just the price and point of sale stuff. There's also uh, payroll data. Like, like he kind of has a, a full 360 view of the economy to some degree. And I think that it does beg the question. So we have, I don't know, we can call it like an analog version of price uh, um, collection versus even if you look at apartment.com or Zillow, open yep. door, like all of these real-time data points and sometimes 100 million data points. Well, they points don't use real-time data. So here's the funny thing. There was just a Twitter thread about this this morning. So you talk about leasing um, the methodology really matters. So if you say, what is the rate of inflation on rental prices? You can calculate it two different ways and you can, you'll immediately see the difference. One is across all leases in the United States. The other is leases signed in the last three months. Guess what? One is up like 41% and one is up 6%. Guess which one actually tells you where you are? I can only imagine. <laughs> um, when you start to think of uh, the geopolitical landscape, there's a lot of blaming of inflation on the uh, Putin price hike and other uh, uh, excuses that have been uh, invented recently. Um, but I don't know if you saw, I think Putin yesterday or today gave a speech. And in it, he basically said, hey, this is exactly what's happening. He talked about the monetary expansion. He talked about uh, the U.S.'s uh, sanctions and how that drastically reduces people's trust in keeping their uh, uh, foreign currencies and reserves uh, with the U.S. system. How much do you think about things outside of the tech industry or the business industry when it comes to geopolitics, inflation, or, or other things that could be like macro or external shocks to the system? Well, I don't think this is a macro shock. This is pretty simple. There's a let's see, there's two, only two variables that lead to inflation. You have a, a, a fairly finite amount of goods produced. And over time, it's not finite, but at one point in time, a fixed point in time today, this week, maybe next month, there's a, only a certain amount of variance to how many goods there are. That's all the goods that can be bought by everybody in the world or everybody in the country. And when the government prints more money, there's only one thing that can happen. There's more money chasing the same number of goods. Guess what? The price has to go up. Like this is so basic. <laughs> it's like, uh, basically, uh, so where you're going with this, by the way, I actually think all life kind of works this way. Now, there's a couple fundamental principles, and once you understand them, the world just makes common sense. It's like, you know, Newtonian physics and stuff like that. What's it's another like, example? Um, like, like another example of how this applies to rest of life? Well, I, well, let's see. Yeah, this was another one, a good one. I stumped I, Keith or a boy. Everyone no, it's just like I have so many of these. <laughs> like, it's like simple, it's basic, simple rules. Like, I, I did tweet once. I was actually pretty popular, surprisingly popular tweet that like the easiest way to be successful is just forget all the stupid stuff in the world. If you didn't know anything, you'd probably be more successful. I was going to ask you at the end, but I'll ask you now, uh, are you going to put your kids through traditional school or how do you think about educating them so that they don't have to unlearn things later? Good question. They're 11 months old, so starting to think about it. They're not ready for homeschool yet, although we are interviewing educators to start like indoctrinating them. I've taught, I've actually taught uh, the little baby boy, like my favorite expression, which is no, no, no. <laughs> But <laughs> really good at it. I guess. How do you think about the legacy education system, and and is it net positive, net negative? Like, do you see uh, specific things that should be changed or fixed there that would have a drastic impact? Yeah, on the I, I mean, uh, homeschooling has been the greatest success of policy in the last forty years anywhere on the planet. So, forty years ago, there's about seventy-eight thousand, I think, kids that went ho that were homeschooled. Last year, there was five million. Th that's where the world's going, and the reason why is some of it's ideological. Like, people that are opposed, parents are opposed to what they're being, their kids are being taught. Um, Zoom sort of unlocked a lot of that exposure because suddenly you could like watch what your kids are being taught and a lot of parents are like barfing, like, oh my God, I didn't realize they were doing that all day. Um, second though is one size fits all education makes no sense. If you want your kids to be successful, you need to allow them to grow at their own pace and challenge them to grow at faster and faster paces. And a, a, you know, a, school, a traditional school room just is not organized that way. So Keith has no clue that I'm gonna ask him this. Um, I want to do an example of how you critically think about topics. And I figured I'd find something that was complex enough, uh, but also not uh, leave you completely out to it's dry. It's like live magic tricks? Basically. Um, gun control has... Uh, <laughs> start, start with the easy stuff and yes. then build from there. Cool. Well, the reason why I think it's an interesting one to uh, kind of talk through is there's an emotional element to it, right? There's obviously people who get hurt, uh, die, and, and um, that emotional component can uh, make people mad, can make people uh, sad, all this stuff. 
there's also kind of a constitutional element to it in, in people's rights. Uh, then there's also a federal level, a state level. There's like this individual responsibility versus dependence on the government. You know, pretty simple problem here. So how do you think through not necessarily what is the answer, but like how do you think through coming to a conclusion as to where you would stand on an issue like that? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, good, it's a good example. Um, so one thing I would do is I tend to like to contrast things either before or after or in multi-states. Like so, like to take data from point A and compare it to point B. And you kind of just did this with COVID, which is a popular thing to do. The reason why, one of the reasons why we moved to Miami was all the policies of San Francisco made no sense to us. Like everything San Francisco and to some extent California was doing were completely irrational. We're just like, we just woke up and said, we're not wasting our lives this way and we're moving, you know, et cetera. So the good news was Miami and Florida were an open laboratory where you could compare different policies around masks and vaccination and indoor, outdoor, weather, all this stuff. And so basically just take that experiment. There's a, uh, you know, the, the framers of the constitution, sort of framers of the country, basically have this call, uh, like clever phrase, turn of phrase called laboratories of democracy. And that the p whole point of having 50 states was that you could have 50 different policies and see what worked and what didn't work. And without that, actually you have one unified policy that you're running one experiment at a time, which isn't a great way to learn. So I always start that way. And there's great places, great books to read. Like I also like books. I have a lot, I actually, built maybe the first library in Miami, um, <laughs> custom, custom built library. Um, I was like, none of the homes here seem to have built in libraries. I need a built in library. So, so it took me six months, but I have one. Um, but so I, I go back to like books, interesting books. What's, a, what's one that so you John Lott, on, on gun control, John Lott, who's a, I think still a professor at the University of Chicago, wrote a series of books about gun control. You know, there's critics and debate, uh, debates about the quality you know, of the research, but it's, it's, it's a pretty good start. And then you can read all the critics of different studies and different chapters if you, if you want to, but it'll give you a good introduction. Um, and then the other thing to do is actually, there, uh, there's a lot of data that, you know, sometimes the world is getting a lot better than people realize. There's a couple, there's two really good books about this, but about how the world's better than people realize. And one thing about gun violence particularly is when I was growing up, the gun violence was like probably an order of magnitude worse than it is today in the United States. Like your chance of being murdered with a gun was like about 10x. Depends where you live in the, but like New York City, for example, where I was growing up, it was at least like basically 10x more likely that you'd be murdered with a gun than today. So to some extent, you also have this like, comparison set of like what problems you're trying to solve, what risks are real, what risks are very real. And we have this a little bit with COVID too. Like if you really cared about the risks of COVID, are you changing everything else in your life? Like your chance at certain ages of dying by drowning was significantly greater than your chance of dying by COVID. Your chance of dying in an auto accident at certain ages was significantly greater than your chance of dying by COVID, but people didn't stop driving. The joke, I think, is always um, there are states that want to leave the United States, or uh, if you go to those states, they may talk about it. California, at one point, somebody proposed to break it up. Uh, Texas, I saw an article recently that there's people who are always talking about it. Florida, it just happens to be kind of you know on the edge, and, and people think it could go underwater or float away. Um, how, how do you think about the state experiment today? Is that what we need to put more emphasis on? Or do you think that there's actually a healthy balance between kind of federal government and state um, experiment? I think the experimentation state level is great. In education, you're also seeing that um, where there's some ideas here that are going to become popular. There's You're seeing, starting to see competition now around policy, like city, city by city policy. Like, why are we all moving to Miami? Because the city here has different policies than other places. And, you know, as uh, I saw a lot of people tweeting, you know, after the the news this morning that Citadel is moving here. A lot of people are tweeting like, oh, well, all these cities are going to have to really start competing. I mean, the framework around city competition is we're now all you know, customers and cities have to compete for our business. States have to compete for our business. We're not, you know, basically locked down into some monopolistic, you know, tyranny. And so that's going to change everything. Now at the city level where everybody tries to attract business, attract you know, entrepreneurs, attract high performing people on different industries. When's the last time you changed your mind? Oh, all the time. Um, it, it, this is underrated. I mean, I used to be a Silicon Valley elitist. I was like the worst offender ever. Like up until like two-ish years ago, uh, maybe three. I, I remember internally even, um, Peter would want to move Founders Fund outside the Bay Area. And he moved outside the Bay Area 2015, I think. Um, and he was always on this crusade that we needed to get Founders Fund out to the Bay Area. And I, I used to think he was like crazy, I'd be like, you know, like this thinking, <laughs> he's making these arguments. That's what made you think he was crazy? What? That's what made you think he was crazy? <laughs> yeah, well, I agreed with most of the other stuff. No, um, 
<laughs> but uh, that, like that's I what was, we call a softball. I would only invest in like companies in Silicon Valley. You know, I had maybe left sub ten percent of my portfolio of investments was outside Silicon Valley until two thousand nineteen. But then obviously I changed you know, pretty radically. And the epiphany, COVID obviously magnified the epiphany, but the epiphany was not from COVID. It was in February 2020. I met this founder from Germany, from Berlin, um, showed up in my office. And I didn't even want to take the meeting, honestly. Like uh, my colleague, Matthias, who you know, was constantly trying to force me to take this damn meeting. I kept trying to cancel it. And he's like, no, you got to take the meeting, you got to take the meeting. I'm like, cancel. <laughs> he's like, take the meeting, take it. Anyway, I show up finally, I sit down. Three minutes into the presentation, I was like, oh, my God, we need to invest. And so I was just like trying Why? to – well, Why? hold on. I'll come down. So I was just like, oh, my God, oh, my God, need to invest. And so I was basically selling the founder on like working with us the whole time. So I walk out of the meeting, and Matias like taps me on the shoulder. At the time, we had, we'd had we only worked together for like about a year. We didn't know each other as well. Um, so he taps me on the shoulder, and he's like, what happened to you? He's <laughs> like, what happened? Like, you know, like you didn't, barely wanted to take the meeting. And I was like, you just found the greatest founder in the history of Europe. And like, we're investing. Um, and so, but that epiphany of like the single, I, I sometimes call him the Michael Jordan. But this, if, if Michael Jordan is sitting in Berlin, then the epiphany was then why the hell do I need to be sitting in Silicon Valley? And why are all the entrepreneurs sitting in Silicon Valley? Because this guy had never been to Silicon Valley before this fundraising trip. He had no connection to Silicon Valley. There was no side channel of information. The new bank example is a little different because they went to Stanford Business School. One worked at Sequoia. So yes, they built a great and very impressive company in Brazil, but they had a lot of infusion of Silicon Valley thinking and people and networks. Uh, Christian at Trade Republic had zero. He'd learned it all sort of online and through osmosis. And I was like, great. Well, if Michael Jordan's sitting in Berlin, then the days of Silicon Valley are over. I asked for questions online. I only am taking one of them because it was so good. When's the last time you were wrong? Oh, yeah, I saw that one. Uh, well, I'm wrong. I mean, the funny thing about being a VC is you're wrong all the time. I'm, you know, like, for example, if I do my job really well, I'm probably right 40% of the time. That means 60% of the time I'm wrong. Yes, but you have told me uh, what is the percentage of founders that you've met just tell you just tell the uh, I don't want to ruin it. For yeah, you. so this is mostly true. <laughs> it's, it's mostly true because every day, like, is an experiment, and you can screw it up. Um, but uh, I've basically maybe met one founder in person that I should have invested in that I didn't in like twenty years. Now but that said, I've turned down a significant number of meetings. But out of the ones that, that you met turned in person, into good companies. So but Keith it, basically said to me one time, he said, uh, out of all of the times that I've met a founder in person, I basically have never missed. And then actually, I, I'm surprised that now maybe there's one. So well, there's like one. It's like one. The one's a complicated story. I actually wound up becoming an investor later, but I, I missed on the seed, which so cost me 100x. <laughs> Small thing. Um, but I fixed it. I, I realized that I made a mistake. That's I'm like, fair. This is, we need to fix this. Actually, that's interesting. So what made you fix it, and why were you not emotionally tied to, like, I missed it, I'll just go find the next early stage company? Well, I mean, without giving away the company, but maybe it's fine to give away the company, um, my mom actually <laughs> convinced me I was wrong. <laughs> true story. This is very true. She's like, why did you pass on the company X? And I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, it's amazing. And I'm like, <laughs> so yeah, like uh, that—that's actually the story I tell publicly. Like when when we announced the financing, because some people knew I had passed earlier. Um, and it was, that that's was, true. It was true. Totally true. And yeah, unfortunately, she's coming to visit this weekend. I'm sure she's going to remind me. <laughs> Has mom ever commented on other investments? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to make her on your put her to your investment committee? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, <laughs> she's got a lot of free time right now. <laughs> um, sitting in Charlottesville, Virginia, she got plenty of time. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, she she she's usually more conservative. That well, that's what was so astounding was, like I remember. When I joined LinkedIn, she's like, nobody will ever use that and put their resumes online. Yelp, like nobody near us in New Jersey, you know, will ever use that, blah, blah, blah. So she's often wrong, but she, she did, this was Stripe, actually. So you actually. were counter-trading she did, mom. She did call Stripe correctly. Yeah, you are counter-trading mom until Stripe, okay. Yeah, now I listen to her much better. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to talk about, I'm just going to call it uh, kind of wokeism. Seems to have infiltrated everywhere. Um, and it's not a, a thing, right? It, it, it is a state of mind. It's a set of ideas, but... Everything from uh, the way we work, the way that we operate on a daily basis, the things we're allowed to talk about, not allowed to talk about, um, just so many things in life. How do you 
think through that problem, right? And, and that is that's, a problem? E that's actually easy. Okay. Just ignore it. How, well, like, I mean, if, but, if something's on the wrong side of history and just wrong, the best thing you can do is like refute, either ignore it or refutate it or definitely don't let it affect you. So like use an example, you've invested in a company. Do you, and you start to see that there is a change in the company and by your reaction, I know you've dealt with this. How do you talk with the founder? Is it a immediate identify it and stomp this out? Is it a let's coach? How do you just deal with it? No, I, I mean, my, my role as a board member and investor is, is really to be a, a, a consigliere, which is like if the founder wants to talk about it, the founder identifies that this is a frustrating or challenging issue, then we can talk about it at length. And I can you know, point them in different directions, people to talk about who've dealt with this before. Here's like the pros and cons of different approaches. But like, it's not my job to kind of fix it, like ever. I have one, well, I do have one job, I have, or two jobs I have to fix. Like if I don't like the founder's funds investing and I have to fix that, and I've actually been a little slacking on that. And then obviously at open store, it's like ultimately my responsibility. All right, we're gonna take questions in one second. Um, you, Peter, Max, I mean, we can go down the line, there's a bunch of them. If you had to sum up uh, one thing when it comes to critical thinking or independent thought that you all share, what is that thing? Is it something you guys read? Is it a way of thinking? Is it you know something that you can tie it all back to and say this is something we did that a lot of other people don't? No, I think that there's just because all these people are very different. Like all the PayPal people that you named and the ones you didn't name that are you know very successful, they all have different asymmetric advantages in life and they figure out how to leverage them. The common denominator is that they do think for themselves. They have their own views on the world. So two examples, there's a, fa a kind of a funny, witty paragraph in uh, Zero to One that Peter talk, Peter leads the book with, which actually originally was going to lead the book if he ever wrote a PayPal book, but enough time was going by, he basically gave it up and put it in Zero to One, that four of the six co-founders of PayPal built bombs in high school. So I didn't build a bomb in high school. I was way too normal for that. But um, maybe now I would, but like back then I was way too, nor <laughs> way too normal. Um, but um, that shows a certain kind of thinking. Now, three of the four, before you get too nervous, actually grew up in communist countries, so building a bomb was probably a pretty good idea. Um, but like, only one of them was an American. Um, but uh, in any event, like that kind of hiring philosophy led to people who were kind of iconoclastic. And iconoclastic people do have the tendency to think for themselves. And then they figure out what areas are they strongest in what dimensions. So Max thinks about things differently than Peter does, than Reed does, than Elon does, than Jeremy Stoppelman or Chad or you know whoever, um, but they all have figured out how to be different. You can see like you can see Chad on Twitter. You can see some of his iconoclastic thinking. Um, sometimes he likes to make fun of Miami. He's eventually he's eventually yeah. moving here, he's whether moving. he knows it or not. Chad South Beach Hurley. That's, yes. that's who's gonna be. All right, what questions do you guys? Have? Just raise your hand and uh, we'll call on folks. Nobody has. Oh, right here. Just yell it out. So, So the question, just in case anyone didn't hear, is uh, basically, is there tension between like hard tech, Varda, Anduril, et cetera, and then more of like the US is screwed, let's build a different, like a, a skate boat basically with crypto, Web3, uh, Bitcoin, et cetera? So two answers. Personally, in a founders fund, um, we don't back trends. We don't invest in trends. We invest in people. So founder, you know, if you read the uh, technology manifesto that founders fund published probably in 2014, uh, we basically have N of one founders. So the right founder, we find the right founder for the right problem and we'll give them money. So we funded Varda, Anderel, funded, there's crypto companies we funded, we bought Bitcoin directly when that was appropriate. Um, so fundamentally, we just want to find the right founder tackling the right problem, not try to you know sort of predict the future. But is there tension? I mean, ultimately there's people probably better suited to solve different types of problems too. 
I'm not sure I'd be the best biotech founder, um, but I could probably learn parts of it. Like for example, there is a heavy biz dev component and distribution component that I can learn. There's some legal co and like FDA, so I could learn parts and contribute. But I, I probably am not designing molecules very well. Um, and please don't adjust these molecules if I design them. Um, secondly. Um, I, I also think the, the best thing about technology is you get to write the future. So you can believe that America's in decline and say, you know what, I'm gonna wake up and do something about it. Like think Farda and Delium um, is actually like America's in decline, we need to do something about it. And they're all like America's vulnerable, we're gonna do something about it. So like technology is kind of this magic wand that you get to shape the future. You pick it up, it's like um, you get learning a code is kind of this magic wand and you wanna rearrange the world and you kind of walk through the world and you kind of wave your wand. Let's do uh, two or three more. Who else got a question? Uh, my question is, why does anybody over 35 years old believe in Web3? Why does anyone over the age of 35 believe in Web3? Uh, please don't use the word decentralization, <laughs> community, or military. I planted him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I guess Chris Dixon's over 35, so we should probably ask him. Um, he's way over 35, actually. Uh, so um, I don't know, I'm not one of the Web3 proponents. I would invest in a Web3 company if I believe the founder was tackling a specific problem that he or she had insight into. And I have you know, funded, I guess, two companies that arguably could be Web3-ish, but they don't brand themselves. Well, one definitely doesn't brand itself, it's Royal. It's reinventing the music industry, it just happens to use some components but it's really reinventing the music industry for the future, not reinventing crypto. The other one is a more Web 3.0 company, but it was the specific founder had insights into a very unique problem. Okay, and my, I stole one more question. Good. So, NFTs are a big bet on the Ethereum chain being in. So the issue means that each of the IPFS is there. And the Ethereum chain, it's pretty slim chance that it's going to be around in 2020 years. So, so the question is about NFTs uh, being built on top of Ethereum, being highly dependent on Ethereum, and a lot of the internet history would suggest that it might not be around 20 years. Well, I, th I think the macro point behind NFT makes sense, which is people are going to have concentric circles of people professionally and socially that they care about in their lives that are more virtual or more digital than real world. Like, i.e., people are gonna manage relationships in the real world differently than they manage relationships. So like when I go out, I you know care about what sneakers I wear, what brand the shirt I'm wearing. You know, do I have an Apple Watch versus like a traditional watch? People are going to encounter more and more people online, and NFTs of different types are a way of self-expression. Self-expression is incredibly important. And is there are there going to be unique ways to express yourself online? Absolutely. And so, what what do you purchase online to express yourself? That's the open question for entrepreneurs. And that, but it's not that's not going away. That's a human emotion back to Shakespeare. And I, th I think the other piece of this is just uh, the underlying technology almost doesn't matter, right? If I ask you guys, what is the tech stack of Google? If you're not an engineer who worked at Google, most of you don't know, right? And so I think at some point it's just like, can people buy what they want? And if it works, then it works. Well, can you transition it to, right? I mean, like most, almost every successful company I've ever invested in or been involved in has recoded itself almost from scratch, at scratch, you know, from scratch at some point. If you have enough traction, you'll reinvent. Like Square started, believe it or not, I hate to give this away, but like, on Ruby on Rails. Um, another very famous site started in PHP. Um, like, you really don't want to worry about that stuff too much. I'm a, I'm a big Web2 fan. You know, I'm in Web2, but I'm very pro Web2. But I don't think that's true. Like, the whole chain is dependent on the database to find a definition of where it's expressed. Why would something look like that? Well, you'll just have a different generation of, like. Well, that's, oh, that's definitely true. But, like, do people. But like, <laughs> do people still collect the same baseball cards that they used to? To some extent, Mickey, Mickey Mantle is still valuable, but like the values of different people change over time too. All right, we're, we're gonna take one more question, but uh, quickly, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin specifically, not the other stuff? What, have you changed your mind at all? So I had two concepts around Bitcoin and they're, they're kind of directionally correct, but not perfectly correct. I don't know that anybody's been perfectly correct in Bitcoin now. For a while, I was, no for a while there was people claiming to be perfectly correct with their Bitcoin predictions. There's actually, I'm not sure anybody has really got it right. So I had two concepts. It's hard when things go up hundreds of percent and down 80%. Yeah, no yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, to, to try calling both of those um, <laughs> to the day. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but in any event, um, I had two concepts around Bitcoin. So, you know, in some ways, I was enthusiastic when it first started because 
the original t-shirts at PayPal, those of you reading the PayPal book will know this, you know, we are t-shirts, I still have some at home. Um, the, the, the world, you know, the world currency, whatever. So the vision of PayPal originally was to try to do this. And one of the reasons I was somewhat dubious about Bitcoin is I remember how damn hard many pieces of that were building the new world currency um, were. But the first thing that occurred to me in 2013 when I started to think about this like professionally, because I didn't become a VC until 2013, was Bitcoin adoption should be inversely correlated with the rule of law. So in countries that have a predictable rule of law, there should be less adoption in a, on a per capita basis or whatever, or per G of G, GDP or something, some metric, than in countries that have a predictable rule. And you can even argue that kind of happened in the United States, like according to some people, after Trump got elected, we had less rule of law here, and you do see Bitcoin actually appreciating after the election of Trump. But the, the number two point that's probably more live and relevant is I believe in Bitcoin was a speculative asset in that eventually if you could stitch, people like to speculate. People speculate on stocks, obviously. People will speculate on NFL games. Like speculation is a really big business in the United States. If you could get everybody to adopt a platform on a speculative basis, could someone build an application layer on top of the network or the nodes that were built on speculation and power some fundamental utilitarian thing that was not speculation? Absolutely. So I started saying this as early as 2015 publicly. Then, you know, basically no one's really built that application layer on top. But there's a lot of nodes that were built in this speculative era. Now with prices going down in other, let's say, in equities going down, and less people have less dollars available for speculation, you may have to build on top of the nodes that are already, you know, sort of plugged in. But that's like 80 million folks. I mean, this is, uh, if you read, um, what is it, Power Law, I think they talk about a lot of speculation, a lot of capital goes in. You basically build the infrastructure and then eventually do it. Um, last question, no pressure. The question is, uh, science started to become very political, but a huge piece of science is collaboration, especially sometimes across borders. But if it gets politicized, how does a scientist in America and a scientist in China work together if there's this political divide? I think that was a choice that scientists, scientists in quotes made. Most scientists in history that you remember the names of were incredibly controversial in their own times. And so I think there's a certain character to the scientists to come up with the most important ideas and then eventually bring the world with them. It's not the other way around. Like, how do I dumb down my ideas to be approachable to everybody? That's it. All right, everyone. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Real quick, Constantine, thank you very much. I think we have this place uh, for like another hour or so hour and a half so enjoy there's drinks upstairs there's drinks downstairs if you need a lawyer constantine's right there go harass the shit out of them uh at reed smith <laughs> yeah, yeah one lawyer for the whole room all right thank you guys